Okay, uh, quick question. How many of you guys feel more comfortable listening uh, the session in English? Please raise your hands. Okay, uh, considering that it's my English, so it's not the standard English, but very bad English, by the way. Okay, so uh, the, topic, the topic of this session uh, is about how to create a very quick uh, chat, Android chat application using uh, different uh, functionalities like, for example, a cloud backend, uh, push notification, uh, and RESTful API, and so on. Uh, who I am? I'm Alfredo Morresi, he's written also over there, and I develop a relations program manager for Google in Italy. So basically what I try to do in my daily job is to make uh, develop Italian developers happy in using uh, Google technologies. But if you want to make me happy, you can invite me to have a session of the boarding tomorrow in the mountains here or offering me some tiramisu. It's good enough. You can reach me at those addresses, so feel free to ping me for whatever you want. And uh, I will demonstrate to you an application that you can download from this link in the Play Store. It's a very basic application, so doesn't, uh, don't think about something super good, super nice, but it's just to show you the basic of the infrastructure and of the functionality. Three, two, one, okay, got it. So, uh, I can assure you that we can create this application in less than 40 minutes, so more or less the length of this session. Why? Because we basically don't care about a lot of stuff that uh, Google Cloud Platform will manage for us. This session is Android focused. I'm not going to talk about Google Cloud Platform, just uh, the very, very basic that we need to understand in order to know how the Android application works. But if you have additional questions about Google Pl Cloud Platform, please feel free to ask me after the session or during the question and ask for a moment. Okay, so a typical chat application has to have a kind of backend in which people send messages, notify other clients about new messages, authorize and authenticate people, and stuff like that. So, uh, using a Google Cloud Platform and a particular uh, call, uh, project called uh, uh, Mobile, Mobile Backend Starter, you can totally forget about the implementation of the backend. And then you have also additional goodies with this backend. You have, uh, for sure, the possibility of customizing this backend because it's open source code, is already deployed on the cloud, but you can simply download the solution make the change that you want and upload your changes. You have a cloud data store, so your data are in the cloud. You don't need to provide uh, additional uh, data or databases or storage, uh, storage ways. You have push notifications and other goodies, for example, user authentication, authorization, and you can create this application for, I don't know, the people in this room, but if the application is successful, you can scale to billions of people without changing any single line of code. And uh, I think that one of the most important goodies is that it's totally free. Uh, if you stay under a particular quota, and uh, I more or less can guarantee you that uh, if we do an application for the people here in this room, we are under this particular usage quota, everything is free. You don't uh, even need to insert your credit card to, to get started. So, how to create this backend? Very, very easy. You go to this link, you follow the wizard, and basically you have to create a Google Cloud project. So I don't, I don't want to explain how to create and stuff like that because out of, it's out of topic for this session. You put some parameters. You select that you want to deploy mobile backend starter, and this is the basic solution with everything, and you have done. You don't need to do anything else for the cloud part. So you have a working backend with all the goodies I've told you. Then you can download the Android application source code. Also, this one is open source, so you can uh, take a look at it or modify or implement or use it as base for what you want to do. Customize three parameters of this code, and uh, basically you have done and you have a working chat application. It's the one that you have just downloaded from the Play Store. 
Is this magic? No. <laughs> it's just a lot of uh, good, good practices, uh, uh, code and stuff like that put inside both the Android application and the server-side code. So let's discover together the most important uh, components of this architecture. The first one, when we talk about an application that uh, needs to chat, for sure is to communicate with your server and get data back from your server. So, basically, access to your server. You can uh, access to your server in a lot of different ways. You can create your customized transport uh, way, or your protocol, or your, I don't know, custom service. You can, you can use libraries, whatever you want. But nowadays, one very, very used path in the web, web world is to create RESTful API that you can consume in your client, mobile, web, desktop, whatever you want. So using the Google Cloud endpoints, basically you can create those RESTful APIs without worrying about writing the code. You only need to put some annotation, some particular stuff on top of your Java or Python code, and launch a command that automatically for you generates both the server code to create those RESTful APIs, but most important, the client side code. So you have a boilerplate code generated for you for Android, iOS, and web application. So basically in different kind of clients. You are not uh, uh, bounded to the Google ecosystem. It's something that you can use even in iOS or every kind of desktop and web application. This is the basic documentation to understand what cloud endpoints are. Again, it's a cloud service, so I'm not interested in talking about them right now. Because we need to take, uh, okay, uh, together with the cloud endpoints, you also have uh, this particular console that you can use to browse uh, throughout your APIs. It's the same that you use when you need to explore the standard Google APIs, from, so from Calendar to Gmail, YouTube, and all the services that Google uh, uh, exposes. And uh, for free, you have the same console on your project. Basically, you need to point the browser to this address, and your project ID is the, cloud, the Google Cloud project ID you have created before. How to set up your, your brand new backend to use, so to communicate with the client? It's very easy. You go to the address of your backend, you select this option, so open, no authentication, no authorization, everyone can communicate with me. Then you need to take the project ID of your code and put it into the project ID field of the Android application. You need to check that, that uh, is auth enable uh, value is set to false, and you have done. You have a working application that can chat, that can send and receive messages from a backend. Okay? Very easy, not so complex. So, how it works? Uh, you can imagine that there is a lot of code behind, but in reality, there are uh, maybe five, six lines of code that you need to understand. The first one is about Google Cloud Endpoints. As I said, uh, uh, Google Cloud Endpoints create the boiler, the code for you and wrap everything inside a particular class ca called, in this case, mobile backend. You can uh, even customize the name of the class. And so you need to create, instantiate and this class. You select a transport, you select a JSON service that can decode and encode your JSON data. And then you set the URI of your cloud backend. Okay. After that, you build, so you create this uh, mobile backend object, and then the real code to access your API is this one. So you have a cloud entity, so any given uh, entity of your mobile application, you can do whatever you want. You put data on it. You should move this application, this cloud entity from uh, your domain to the backend domain. So in this case, uh, translate from cloud entity to entity DTO. Cloud entity is your entity in the local, in the mobile application. Entity DTO is the application used by your APIs. And then you call 
backend is the mobile backend. Endpoint v1 because uh, cloud endpoints uh, allow you to create different versions of your API in the same backend. So, for example, you can have uh, work the first version and the second version of the same API working together. So, you put this one and uh, the name of the method of the API method that you want to call. Okay? Very, very easy, very, very straightforward. You get the result here. Okay, here you get the result and you have done. So these line of those lines of code basically are the one required to call and insert RESTful API, adding some data, some object, and getting back the result of this insert. Okay, so basically there are three, four lines of code with a log. Everything clear right now? Okay, so second step we need to add authorization and authentication. So what does it mean? Uh, authorization is the fact that uh, everyone or just a selected group of uh, people, application, uh, devices, can access to your APIs. Because you can have APIs for the public, so it's important that everyone can, ac can access to them, but you can also say, okay, this is those APIs, I want to expose them on the internet, but I want that only my Android application or my web application or my iOS application are able to consume my APIs, okay? And so you need to set up the authorization. Then you can go further and say, okay, only authenticated users can use my APIs, okay? So, also in this case, you can uh, implement everything by your own, you can create all the code required to manage uh, so, so much thing, or you can simply use, also in this case, mobile, uh, sorry, cloud backends that manage everything for you. You only need to set up two parameters. The first one is uh, a client ID, um, basically a Android client ID, but can even be uh, iOS client ID or web app client ID. So, it's something that uh, unite, uniquely identify your application, okay? So you can say, those APIs can reply and can be consumed only by those, this set of client IDs, okay? Nothing else. And then, because you want to be authenticated, to, sorry, uh, see, yes, because you want to be authenticated to the API, you also need to define the web client ID. It's typical of the OAuth2 flow, so instead of asking for user permission, because basically you are, the same of, you are the same mobile developer and web developer, so you don't need to ask the user, give me your permission to access your data on my, on my server with my application. It's pretty much stupid. And so you need this client. How to obtain those clients? Also in this case, it's very straightforward. You go to your uh, project, you go on credential, create, click on installed application, Android, and the learn more uh, link give you all the information uh, required to obtain basically this fingerprint, and uh, you have done. You have the Android client ID. Here it is. Then you can, again, on credential, create a new uh, credential, web application, because you are not managing third-party application, you can simply leave uh, those fields uh, as the default. Otherwise, here you should put uh, a lot of other stuff. And then you have your client ID. So, Android client ID, web client ID, you put them on your backend in the setup page of your, of your backend. And this is just an example. You can put uh, those uh, parameters in your backend in the way you like. It's not important that you use this particular configuration page. Enable the security on your backend. So before you remember, before it was open, now is uh, secure. Before it was open, now is secured. Set those values on the const in the Android client. And again, you have done. Now you have a working chat application that authenticate users and uh, do all the stuff required to, uh, and uh, sorry, the APIs only accept uh, connection from your application, okay? So, also in this, in this case, it's not black magic, <laughs> it's code 
and we are going to analyze a little bit of it. First step, authentication. Uh, you can uh, ask for the user a username, a password to create a new account, to use another account, you can do whatever you want, or because you are in Android in this specific case, you can even use the account that the user has configured to use the device. So instead of asking for a brand new username, a brand new password, or give me your credential because you can trust me, okay guys, no way, you can directly ask to the Android system, please, to, sorry, to the user, please pick up the account that you want to use, so no need to disclose your password, using the standard um, account chooser dialog, so nothing new, something that the user already know, because it's the, sa the same picker used in other applications. You r read only the name, not the password, so only the email address of the user, so we are pretty much uh, still in safe. And then, giving this, uh, those data, you can create this particular object called the HTTP request initializer. So you see here, I configure it to use the user credential. And I pass it when I initialize my mobile backend. You remember at the beginning, we used three parameters, the transport, the JSON factory, and the null. In this case, because I want the user to be authenticated, I should pass this uh, HTTP request initializer set with the username that I want to use. Automatically, now your backends API take care of everything for you. So, uh, to the backends API, uh, only an authenticated user now can access without the need of specifying his password and something uh, other. So, it's also in this case, it's very, very easy. Question right now? Okay, third step, push notification. So, here, a question time for you guys. What are different ways of uh, asking, uh, of obtaining, of achieving this goal? I want a screen where I can see all the messages of all the user, a uh, more real-time way that I can. Polling. Why? Why polling? Okay, it's true. Other ways? Push notification, great. Some other suggestions? Okay, basically, uh, if you want to get access with polling, the drawback of polling is that if you have, I don't know, 10 clients, it may work. But, it consumes a lot of battery life in the client. And if you poll every 10 minutes to reduce battery impact, uh, you have a screen that is updated only every 10 minutes, okay? So the other way is totally flip the coin and uh, let the server say to the client, I have something new for you. Or, it's better, something has happened my side, now it's your time, it's your turn to understand what. You can simply say a kind of input or you can, in, you can uh, also uh, add a payload to the message that the server sent to the client. For Android, you can use push notification and the only way to use push notification, the, okay, the only Google way to use push notification is to use Google Cloud Messaging for Android, okay? The new version has also the possibility to send messages back from client to server. So for example, if you have different devices, you receive an Hangouts message. When you read it on your, on, in one of your devices, the notification disappears from all the other devices. Why? Because first the server sent a notification to all of your devices about a new incoming uh, Hangouts message. Then when you read it on one of your device, this device sends back to the server, okay, done. And so the server sent another message to all the other devices, please let the notification disappear. Okay, so you can also maintain a kind of sync state, it's not really, not a real sync, but a consistent state across different devices. 
Enabling uh, Google Cloud Messaging, also in this case, is very easy. You have to enable the API in the cloud project you have created. Then you need to create an API key. Very, very easy. Click, three click, no more. And you obtain this API key. You need to insert this key inside the, your backend. Okay? Enable push notification. You can even configure here how to send push notification to iOS devices using the iOS way of sending push notification. And basically, you have done. You only the latest step is to take the project number in your cloud project and put it inside the Android client. Okay, in the project number field. So as I said at the beginning, three parameters on client. On, sorry, on mobile client and a couple of keys on the back-end side. And you have a working application. Okay, it's true, it's a simple chat application, but inside this application you have implemented a working method of accessing data through RESTful APIs. So you can extend your APIs in the back-end, gener generate the new client code, and start consuming the new APIs in your mobile client. You have working push notification. So the server, every time receives something new, update all the client for you. And you also have authorization and authentication on API access. It's, it's not nothing at all. So also push notification are not magic, are simple code. Let me see this code. So you need to obtain a registration ID for your device from the server. So you simply, the first time that your application starts, uh, try to register with the server. Once the application receives the registration ID, generally it stores inside the, the application uh, storage. So you can reuse it over time. And the classical, the typical pattern to receive push notification is a classical, very well-known pattern in Android. So you need to create a broadcast receiver because the Android system, basically every time it receives a particular notification, wake up the broadcast receiver of your application telling it, OK, I've received a push notification for you. Now it's your turn to manage the notification. So, Generally, the path to, is to create a broadcast receiver that receives this message from the system, and then this broadcast receiver wake up, wakes up a, in a service, and the service processes the real request. So in this case, the broadcast receiver creates a wakeful service. So even if, yours is, uh, even if your device is in uh, uh, hold mode, is switched off, and stuff like that, you can resume it, and then you handle this intent. And the push notification is inside the extra, the bundle of the intent. You, as I said, you can have just a, a simple input. Something is, has happened on my side, or a simple input with a payload. And so, for example, for a short message, you can even pass the beginning of the message directly in the push notification. So you don't need to connect back to the server to download something and to do your stuff. OK, one important thing. Registering to the server is a network operation. So do it in async way. Don't block the main thread of your application just because you want to register to the server. Or don't put in the main flow of your application. It's something that has to be in the async side, side from your application. OK, questions right now? OK, I can uh, repeat for you if you want. need to make sure that the services will not make you know will not be uh, destroyed or I, I think that uh, having this kind of service uh, destroyed by the system is 
pretty much impossible because uh, you you create you have a broadcast receiver so the broadcast the broadcast receiver wake up a service the service obviously if you if if uh, if you receive uh, uh, i don't know uh, a notification a push notification and then you start updating all of your data downloading uh, gigabytes from the internet obviously you My can happen. have problems okay. but if you uh, if you maintain the service uh, uh, quick and maybe the service uh, creates other uh, tasks or other uh, Android uh, patterns that are more suitable for processing uh, long operation, you should be okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, bonus step. All the PI calls are network operation. And so? Async them. <laughs> no way. Uh, this kind of uh, okay. Async them. This kind of uh, call you cannot. Okay, you can do whatever you want, but it's super, super wrong to put this line of code inside, for example, the on-click listener of your button. Okay, avoid this because it's wrong, because the user have the main uh, UI thread blocked, you have to wait for the network, you don't know the timeout, and everything is going to, have to be a mess. So, what's the one of the good way of managing this kind of async call? Inside the application, the demo application, the team created a cloud backend, is a sort of manager that is responsible for managing calls to the web services. So, the Android application only knows this cloud backend. Then the cloud backend knows that you have to create a mobile backend class, set parameters, and stuff like that. So it's totally a black box for the rest of the Android application. And then on top of this cloud backend, cloud backend async extends the basic method of cloud backend adding async task. So he creates handlers, he creates a lot of stuff. Obviously, you can say, yes, I, but it's nice, but I can do everything in just one class. Okay, why create two separate classes? So, here the sample is a uh, uh, cloud. Here, you create an handler, okay? And then you create, you call the, your cloud backend async, in this case, and then you ask for something passing the handler, the callback, basically, at the end, okay? Why this is good to use at least two separate classes? Okay, to make the discussion more compelling, I can offer you a gadget if you reply in the right way. <laughs> Ideas? I can say you that is something about uh, quality of the code. Okay, but this is the basic of uh, putting all the code inside one class that is a manager. The real question is uh, why I created two different classes, one with the basic logic and the one that had async operation on top of the basic class. More or less. Okay, I think I did. Okay. Yes, you can. Oh, uh, yeah, but you need to build something. Uh, you, you cannot simply extend your class, but you have to build some dependency injection mechanism on top of the async task. Yeah. Okay, how many of you guys use. Uh, you can write tests. We can write tests. Yes, uh, great, finally. Because in this case, you can write tests, easily write tests. You can simply test your cloud backend, so the non-async class, whatever you want in the uh, another test uh, project uh, <laughs> in any way, and then just separate, sorry, not just, and separate the complexity of all the sync management in another class. You can even create a mock of this class 
So you can test, you can test the asyncicity of the class in another test. Okay? You got this. Great. <laughs> so, uh, one other hit about uh, activity life cycle. Uh, life cycle. Uh, in this application, uh, you know, there is a lot of way to, nowadays in Android to do async, to pers persistent information when you rotate your device, when you lose your activity, and stuff like that. So there are really, really a lot of ways. And inside the application, there is just one way, but I'm sure, guys, that you can do better. So basically, uh, the main activity, the activity with the list of all the messages, create a fragment. Generally, fragment are used to detach pieces of user interface from the main activity so you can recombine them or use them and stuff like that. In this particular case, this fragment has no interface. And so you say, but why I should use something uh, uh, that should be used for de detaching pieces of user interface and now use it without interface? Basically because uh, setting that parameters allow to the fragment to remain in memory even if the creating activity is destroyed. So, for example, if you rotate the screen or the activity is destroyed to uh, get back some resources, the fragment should remain. So, basically, when your activity is created, at the beginning, check if there is this fragment. If not, it creates its set the state. Otherwise, it's simple reattach to the existing fragment. And so, because you attach, you can store all your data inside this fragment. Okay, as I said, you is not uh, the best pattern because uh, every pattern should have a context in which it is applied, but if a very quick, okay, not so dirty, but quick for sure way pattern to store information when you destroy, create activity and stuff like that. Then, if you want to extend the data model of this application, because, you know, it's a simple chat application. Chat has a time, a author, and a message. Everything, so both the client code and the backend code, can store whatever kind of data you want. So it's not, uh, uh, for, it's not only for messages, but when you create your cloud entity, you remember at the beginning, in the, in the insert click, and you put the message, you can also create a new property with a defined key, and this property will be stored in the backend. So you don't need to write additional code. Okay? Just add your line, and obviously, when you get back the information from the server, you can simply check for the existence of this property. Okay? Very easy. Additional questions? Okay, for the cloud backend is all, and if you are located in Italy and you want to be updated on uh, what Google is doing for developers in Italy, the only good point to follow is that one. So, take a note about the, ah, okay, it's, it's bad, is uh, okay, sorry, <laughs> I need to fix the, the, the link, but the, the blog is developersitalia.blogspot.it, okay, so I need to fix the address. And given that, I say you thank you. And if you have questions, I'm here for another five minutes, more or less. OK. <laughs> questions? Nothing? So you have five minutes of your time back. Use it as much as you can.